you'll almost always see me or hear me reference them as sig figs because I think it's easier to say, less syllables. Those are our three rules. You can use the rules in the textbook or the tutoring center. Any of those are fine. They all do the same thing. I just feel these condense it down a little bit more succinctly and allow you to get to the answer quicker and more efficiently. Okay. So that's why <clears throat> I've used these rules. And these are rules that I developed. I didn't cheat and use somebody else's rules um, because I thought sig figs was confusing. And I looked at the five, six rules and I'm like, they seem to overlap and that's how I built these. Okay. We had the measurement or exact. Really, I just want to skip through that. I remember some things aren't strictly measurements, they're exact things. These largely pop up with definitions, like the amount of inches in a foot. Okay? As a definition, they are infinite sig figs, okay? which becomes super relevant when we move into the next section and we discuss why is it important to look at sig figs. Okay? And this is going to come in when we actually do calculations or mathematical operations. So if we look at addition and subtraction, when we add different measurements that have different precisions, okay, or different sig figs, our result is only as precise as the least precise measurement. Okay, which means when we go through to add this up, okay, we could go through and do our long hand. Come on, pen. Our long hand on this, we get two, six, three, five, and eight is thirteen. Carry the one. 10, 16, carry the 1, 15, 1, 1. Okay. For the record, <clears throat> I won't make fun of you for doing something like that with carrying the 1s. I have a friend that made fun of me ruthlessly for doing all that. They're like, can't you do that in your head? No. Yeah. Okay. I also would highly recommend that you use a calculator. Okay. And there's simple calculations. We're like, all you did was divide by 100. That just means you moved the decimal. There's two directions you can move the decimal, and more often than not, you're awesome at doing that outside of the exam. As soon as you move to the exam, you screw it up and go the other direction. Right? If you enter it into the calculator, you minimize that mistake, okay? or at least decrease the odds. So that is now our addition. And what we might go through and say, well, then our answer is 115.63362 grams. Right? And we'd be wrong. Okay? This is where we get our addition subtraction. The result is only as precise as the least precise place. Where's the least precise place? Okay. This first number comes in as the least precise place. I only have information up to the tenths place. So that is now my least precise place, which means my answer can only get reported to the point 6. When I do this addition, the number is not as shown. It is actually 115.6 grams. Okay. The rest of those numbers disappear. Okay. And this tends to freak students out because you're, I have all of those numbers. Shouldn't I use them? You can only use them if you have equal information all the way through. Okay. To get that number, the point, point 0.63362, what did you assume was the case in the 114.3? What number came after 3? After that? Uh, and after that and after that. You made the assumption that all four of those were zeros. The measurement doesn't specify those zeros because it literally has no clue what those numbers are. It could be zero. It could also be nine. Okay. If it's nine, does that change the answer? Yes. Yeah. And if we went through and did the math with it being a nine, this time I'm going to do the math a little bit faster. I got better. And we get 115.7346 as opposed to the other one, which I had 115.63362. Right, well, if we look at those two numbers, where do they differ? Well, the 1, 1, same. 1, 1, same. The 5, same. They differ where? At the tenths place. 
You mean the exact location where we're saying that's as far as we can measure out or do our math? Yes. Okay. Because anything after that is now guessing. That's my error. That's where my precision ends. Okay. So when we add and subtract, we have to take into consideration that I don't know what those numbers are. They could be zeros. They could be nines. Those are drastically different results, which means when we add, we have to follow some special rules. Okay. The extra kind of, it's not really a caveat behind this, but you might say, well, why have I never encountered this before? Okay. And even in the lab, I'm in the lab and I will probably never see this. Okay, why not? Well, when you go and use a balance to weigh something, you get a weight, right? You report what it tells you. You weigh another object. What are you using to weigh that other object? Same. Probably the exact same balance, which has the exact same precision, which means when you go through to deal with the math, it all lines up. Okay? We don't have to worry about this weird issue here where you're losing precision in your measurements. Okay? Because it's pretty stupid to go through and do measurement systems of mass on different instruments and then try and add those things together. Okay? You lose information due to those sig figs. So the only time that this sig fig issue really kind of rears its head and becomes problematic is in the lecture. Okay? And that's ultimately it. Okay? Does it play a larger role outside? Yes, because we can go through and do collaborations between institutions where they're weighing off of different balances okay? or they're using different clocks okay, with different precisions in their seconds, okay? which means when we compile that data, we'd have to take into consideration how we're analyzing that with our sig figs. And this can be a really massive issue. Right? It can result in life and death situations. But for the most part, when we run our experiments, we're usually running them individually. We control everything, and as long as we control everything, sig figs don't really jump out as a big issue. Okay? Don't lose the measurements. Okay? So you can't go through and say, well, it said it's 114.3, so I'm going to say it's actually 115. No, the instrument told you it's 114.3, write 114.3. How that make sense? Okay. Well, are there other types of mathematical operations? Yes, we get multiplication and division. Right? And it turns out multiplication and division requires a different set of rules. Right? It's not now the least precise place. It's now the fewest sig figs. So if I take that box and I want to now measure its volume, right, that should say volume. I think area actually works too. Let's just write volume. Pretend that wasn't there. How would I measure the volume of the square or rectangle if you want to get nitpicky? Length times width. What was the length? 7.28. What was the width? 4.6. If I go through and do that calculation, what do I get? 33.488 and officially units squared. I have to keep those units moving through. Right? That's what my calculator spits out. How many of those numbers am I allowed to keep? Well, if we did, say, the addition-subtraction rule, it's least precise place, it would be the tenths place. Okay. But this is multiplication division. I don't do the least precise place. What do I do? Fewest Few sig figs. So I look at the number 7.28, and I say that has three sig figs. 4.6 has two sig figs, which means my answer needs to be two sig figs. And the answer I report is now 33 Unit squared. Okay. The multiplication division one becomes much more important than the addition subtraction because in addition subtraction we have to use the exact same unit. In multiplication division we can use different units. Okay. 
If we have different units, we have different measurement systems, which means we could end up with different <coughs> sig figs and different precisions and all that fun stuff. Okay. Why, again, do we have to do this? When we go through and run this calculation, we're making the assumption, again, that that last place or that extra digit there could be a 0 or a 9. If it's a 9, what happens to the number? It changes. And where does it change? The ones place. Okay, so just like our measurements, we'll report all of the absolute values plus one guess. The same thing holds true with our calculations. Kind of make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so when we went through and did that, notice all the numbers lined up where we didn't actually have to worry about rounding. Right, and rounding does become a big deal. If you get an 89.6 in the class and we say the cutoff is a 90% for an A, what are you probably going to ask? Can you round that up? Well, what are the rules for rounding? Believe it or not, they actually differ from different institutions and different people and different areas of science. Okay. So we need to be specific in the rules that we go through and use. So let's go through and take a look at this first addition subtraction. Okay. What place should we re be reporting to? The hundredths place, because that is the least precise place. So I need to report out to that place. How many sig figs am I answering? Three. But don't I only have two sig figs in that first one? How did I gain sig figs? Because the zero is still... Zero is not significant. I'm just kidding. I, I wasn't going to say significant. I was going to say like it's still there in the, in the 0 0.75. Like you still have to... Yeah. yeah unfortunately, that's not going to be relevant for why we had three. Mm. It's not a bad idea. The rule for the number of sig figs doesn't apply in addition subtraction. It applies in multiplication division. Okay. It does seem weird that when we go through and add numbers, we can increase the amount of significant digits. But we're adding things that kind of actually make sense to increase the number of sig figs. What happens if I subtract things? I could end up with fewer sig figs than I started with. Okay. So typically when we do subtraction, we make sure we have as many sig figs as possible because when I run the calculation, I could very easily lose a bunch of information. Okay. So I report out to the hundreds place. Everybody good with that? All right. The issue is that what's that next number? Five. Okay. So now how do we decide how that five affects that three? Okay. This is our rounding phenomenon. And as you guys already started to suggest, if that first insignificant digit is five or larger, we will add one to the last position, which means the number gets reported as 1.34 grams. Okay? What happens with the other one? <clears throat> Two sig figs versus three sig figs. My answer needs to get reported out with two sig figs. Okay. The issue, my first insignificant digit is five. What do I do? I will add one, and my answer becomes 37 units squared. Okay. And this, again, tends to freak students out. But we had all those numbers. Why can't we keep them? We can't keep them because they have some error associated with those individual values. Okay? In most systems okay, that we deal with in our everyday life, we tend to ignore that error. Okay? We did a measurements lab where we took out and did precision for each of those stupid instruments. Okay? Theoretically, every single measurement you make should have plus or minus what the precision is written next to it. Okay? You've lived a significant amount of time You've taken lots of measurements. How many times have you ever written plus or minus next to your measurements? Probably never. Okay. I'm 10 feet tall. No, 
Why are you saying, no, I'm not? Because I've seen 10 feet. You've seen 10 feet, okay? And I'm not 10 feet. I'm 10 feet, okay? Plus or minus, okay? 10 feet. I'm only measuring as an accuracy of 10 feet. So when I report me saying I'm 10 feet tall, I only have one sig fig, and that's in the tens place. What is my actual height? Six feet. Okay. That would be in the ones place, but I can only report to the tens. Six is five or larger. I would round up to 10. So yeah, I am 10 feet. Okay. That still doesn't, we can't wrap our brain around that because you're like, no, because I can measure with one feet. I don't care if you can measure with one feet. What I'm measuring with is 10 feet. Okay. The device matters in how you go through and measure. Okay? Okay. That's fine. So, our rounding rules, if the first non-significant digit is less than five, then you just leave the number alone. You report all the other digits as normal. Okay? If that first non-significant digit is larger than five, five or larger, I should say, then add one to that last significant digit. Okay. The last part that we have to worry about is rounding. What if you have to do multiple calculations? Should you round at each of those calculations? No, because no. Okay. it turns out that you're fudging the data a little bit. You're changing those numbers a little. Okay. If you round at each of those positions, you're now compounding the error in that rounding. And it starts to create a massive drift in your measurement or your end result. Okay? That means if you have to do multiple calculations, do not round right away, round at the end. So if your calculator comes out and tells you that you have 36.6666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666666
And that's where I reported it, out to the hundreds place. So there's my correct number. Uh, if we tried that again, ooh, multiplication, that's a little bit harder for me to pull out of my head. But see what I can come up with. Uh, actually, let's cheat. What did you guys come up with? Four, five, three, eight. Okay, and officially then we'd add meters cubed because the meters didn't go anywhere. So each of those meters then stacks. Okay, is that number going to be correct? No. no, we did a multiplication here. We have to be aware of our sig figs. So we'd go back and we'd say, okay, well, this one had three sig figs. I understand why I looked at that in a second. This one had five. This one has six. Three sig figs dictate to my answer. I'm only allowed to carry three sig figs. So four, five, three. Hmm. So what a lot of students will go through and do is say, well, that next one is the first insignificant. Because it's larger than one, I'll add one, or larger than five, I'll add one to that. And my answer becomes four, five, four. Okay, this is now your paycheck. Are you going to be particularly happy with that? Why not? Our, our calculator came out and told us that our paycheck should be $4,000. And according to Sig Figs, it's only 400 yeah, damn sig figs. Okay. No, this isn't an issue with sig figs. This is an issue with someone not understanding how to use sig figs. Remember, that four needs to be in the thousands place. How can I make sure it goes into the thousands place? I need to put a placeholder in the ones place to make sure that that four slides up. I'll put a zero there as a placeholder. How do I make sure that that is a placeholder and not a significant digit? Don't include the decimal. The instant you drop the decimal, now what happens? That zero becomes significant. I can't include that zero as a significant digit. That number would be incorrect. I have to leave the decimal place off. Okay. And so the answer is now 4,540 meters cubed. Okay. Uh, next one was a subtraction. Again, I'll see if I can't pull off that. 0 0.03 liters. Anybody see any problems with that? How many sig figs in that answer? One. One. And sig figs in the starting calculations or starting numbers? Four and more than four. Okay. That's a lot of sig figs in my starting calculation, and yet my answer comes out with only one sig fig. Ouch. That really hurts. This is still the correct answer. I lose a lot of information with this calculation. Right? So in a lab environment where I know I'm going to be doing a difference, I'm going to try and set it up where those differences are as large as possible from each other so that I can maintain as much of that sig fig information, okay? Because I know I'll be losing some, okay? So those would be bad lab measurements or bad experimental technique because we've lost a lot of information in that calculation, okay? Last one, ooh, division. Long division in the head. Uh, that's going to be a bit rougher. Uh, carry the one, 0 0.0454. Grams per centimeter cubed. Okay. <clears throat> Your calculator probably spit out something different, but remember three sig figs, five sig figs. My answer has to get reported to three sig figs. There it is. Okay. What happens with the units? I can't get rid of the units. Those still carry through. And since they don't cancel each other, it's just grams divided by centimeters cubed. Okay. So we'll come back to seeing what that unit system means maybe later today. Okay. So how important are sig figs? They're really important for scientists and engineers. If you have to take 151 and 152, they will become exceedingly important. Okay. Within the chemists, at most institutions, but in particular this institution, I tend to be the most lazy with sig figs. 
Okay, so you're actually starting in at probably the easiest level with an instructor with sig figs. Virtually everybody else is the complete polar opposite and thinks sig figs are incredibly important and so test very heavily on them. Okay, so make sure you learn them now so that when you move forward it becomes easier to manipulate and deal with and you always keep track of them. Don't have to take 151 or 152. Don't worry about it. Get through the class. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh, so I thought it might be a good idea to put everything all on one slide. So here's one slide that you could go through and print out to constantly review. For those of you pulling out your cell phones, that's fine. Go ahead and do so. You can take a picture of that. But it is on the, in the PowerPoints that are posted. All right, so this has all our sig fig rules. It has what happens with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and our rounding rules. You need to be thinking of these when? Every time you run a calculation, period. Okay. As you will discover and as we'll discuss when you look at practice exams, believe it or not, the only time you're really being asked about sig figs is when it is specifically a sig fig question. And you will be able to look at your answer choices and go, that's what this question is asking. Right. Regardless of what else is said, you can just look at the answers and say, that's all this is asked about. Okay. Yay, nomenclature. So I forgot to go through and take a look. How many of you actually had a chance to go through and look at that video? That's not too bad. If you didn't get a chance, did you look at the textbook? A little, okay. So we've got four things listed out here. We want to be able to come up with a name for these. Okay, so what I want you to go through and do, you've had a little bit of practice, do the best that you can, come up with the name for the first two and the formula for the last two. See what you can come up with. And just because this can be a bit frustrating, we'll give you an idea of time crunch. You've got four questions, five minutes. Officially, it should be like two minutes, but. About nomenclature, it's just an answer. Right, which means how much work would there be shown for nomenclature? Very little, which means more than likely, where is this showing up on the test? Multiple choice. Right? And in multiple choice, yes, you're expected to get the answer, but you're also given a bunch of other wrong answers. So if you can get some information down about what you know to be true, you can potentially eliminate answers from the multiple choice. Okay? We don't have multiple choice here, so we can't do that. Okay? But think about that when you approach nomenclature. You can whittle away answers. That is not a bad strategy. But to do so, you should have some information that you know is true. Okay? And people will go, well, I know CR is chromium. 20 minutes into the exam, CR becomes carbon. Don't keep it in your head, write it down. Okay? Once it's written down, you now have something that you can work with and you can manipulate and you can look at and verify, yes, that was right. Okay? Or no, that was completely wrong. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that down. That's fine, but you now have something to look at. The instant you keep it in your head, you increase the odds of making a simple mistake and getting it wrong. Okay, so what I'm going to attempt to do is show you how I would work through this. Okay? And because I'm working through it as fast as I can, I probably won't talk a whole lot, but I might mumble to myself a little bit. Okay? So what I'm going to go through and do is how I would recommend you should do any kind of nomenclature problem. It is much quick, easy information down first and then start to layer in more and more information as you go. Okay? So we'll wait five seconds and we can time this. So 29.30 is where we're starting this. Go. So three.
never freaking remember this. I need to go back and look at that one. Ugh. Whoops. Thirty-one thirty. What was that? Two minutes? That's roughly where you should be. How many of you have anything remotely approaching that as far as work? Okay. Everybody should be showing that amount of work. And it, if you don't know how to do that, that's a separate, that's a separate issue. Okay? But this is me who knows the material showing this work. Okay? Which means when you go through and solve, you should also be showing this work. Okay? So... With any of those, does anything stand out where you're like, what did you do there? All of it doesn't count. Okay, the last one. So, some things that kind of happened on the background that I didn't actually discuss was knowing some of these pieces. So, lead, I knew the symbol was PB. This is something that now you should already know. That's instant. Okay? Acetate is now a tricky one because what element is acetate? It's not an element. Okay? It's a complex ion. It's a polyatomic ion. Okay? When we go through to build compounds, it turns out that there are certain arrangements of elements that form extra stable species or extra stable things. Those things we can now build with. Acetate happens to be one of those things. Okay? So how do I know that acetate is C2H3O2? How did I know that lead was PB? Where on the periodic table does it say lead is PB? You have to memorize it. You had to know that the symbol PB meant lead. Guess what you also have to memorize? The symbol acetate, or the word acetate, means the symbol C2H3O2. What if it's C2H4O2? It's not acetate. Okay? That is now an entire piece that means acetate. That is a complex ion, a polyatomic ion. In the video, there's a list of polyatomic ions. And it's also in your textbook. I forget what table it is. But chapter 6 somewhere, there's this list of polyatomic ions. Right? I think it's 6, maybe 7 of them. In the video, have stars next to them. Why are they starred? You need to memorize those. Those are the most common ones that show up. Okay. I expect you to have those memorized. Okay. Very similar to the elements for memory where I went through and bolded some, same concept applies. Okay. And we looked at our elements. We went through and did ionic charges. You were required to know the ionic charge of certain elements. You now had to add that to your flashcards if you were memorizing your elements. Guess what you have to do for the polyatomic ions? Name, symbol, and charge. All of that information has to be memorized. Okay. One of the things that's unfortunate with the polyatomic ions is I can't cheat and use the periodic table to tell me the charge. Okay. I could do that with the elements. I can't do that with the polyatomic ions. I have to have them memorized. Okay. To that kind of end, what we're looking at is, again, nomenclature. 
the tutoring center offers workshops on topics that students find particularly troublesome. One of those topics is on nomenclature, which I think they're doing one tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think they're doing one tomorrow. Go ahead and check it out. One of the things that they will do is talk about ways that you can help memorize those relationships, where the charges come from, where the names are. Okay? Some people find those things useful, others don't. I tend to be one of the people that don't, and I can't ever remember any of the mnemonic devices. It's not completely true. I memorized Roy G. Biff. But okay, most I can't deal with. The tutoring center has something about Paul's camels st starving in Phoenix, and it magically comes up with the formulas okay, and the charges for <coughs> most of the polyatomic ions. Okay, again, I don't know much about it, so I can't really repeat it, but I know they have it. Okay, yeah. I, I haven't seen the video yet. So That's okay. Like the video will actually go in a little bit more depth as well. Okay, so let's, don't ask me. For those people that watch the video, what do you think to an answer to his question? Yeah, it gives you a little bit more spin. Okay. Fine. So it's there. The textbook will also do it. It's just a different way to spin it and repackage it. Okay. Right. One of the things that I think can be daunting is when we're looking at nomenclature, there's five distinct naming systems. So in the video, all five distinct naming systems are presented. You can only use one set of rules for an individual compound. You can't use all four or all five. So you have to be able to look at the compound and quickly identify which rule set should I be using. Okay. So the bottom one, acetate. Acetate, I know, is a complex ion. Because it's a complex ion, I know that last one is ternary. Ternary means? more than two, okay? Tur, you can think three, okay? So as soon as I see either acetate and have it memorized as C2H3O2, well, are there more than two elements in this compound? I have lead, I have carbon, I have hydrogen, I have oxygen. That's four elements, yes. By definition, that fits the ternary rule. Now the question, is it ternary ionic or ternary acid. Well, how do I decide that? Because it doesn't have an AQS or whatever. That okay. So we could pull rules from what makes it an acid. Acids usually have, well, should always have, for the sake of this class, an AQ at the end of the name. Okay. Or at the end of the formula, but you're given the name, so that becomes difficult. Okay. The name should always say acid. Does it say acid? No, so it's not a ternary acid, which means it's ternary ionic. Okay, so we could come to that answer by saying it's not one thing. Well, what is an ionic compound? Negative and a positive. A negative and a positive, sure. Does lead acetate show negative or positive? No. No, so I don't accept that. You're right, but I don't accept that. A metal and a non-metal. A metal and a non-metal. What is lead? A metal. A metal. The instant you see a metal, you should be thinking ionic. Acetate told you ternary, lead tells you ionic. You're now using the rules for a ternary ionic compound. Okay. Those rules are very similar to the binary ionic compound, but they differ in that you name the complex ion. Okay. So I know acetate is C2H3O2, and then I know lead is PB. The next part is I need to know how much lead and how much acetate needs to go into this compound. Okay. Well, one of the things we're always doing in chemistry is striving for neutrality. Okay. And we do it in real world situations too. Okay. We try to reach an agreement where everybody is at least equally unokay with the decision. Okay. Welcome to politics. Okay. But that's what we're hoping for. We don't go through and deal with fascism or communism because those are now so extreme that not everybody's okay with it. So we try to find some middle ground. Chemistry is doing the same thing. I do not want radicals. I don't want charges. I want those charges to be neutralized. So when I build a compound, I will pick the amount of each of those pieces that neutralizes the charge. Well, then crap, I need to know what the charge is. Yes. That's why when I wrote down acetate, what did I write right underneath it? 
a minus 1 because I know acetate is a minus 1 because I memorized it. You'll notice that the lead got the plus 4 a little bit later. Why did it get the plus 4 a little bit later? I didn't have it memorized. I had to interpret it from the name. What does the Roman numeral IV stand for? 4. Four. The Roman numeral will tell me the charge on certain metals, and only the metals. Right? It'll tell me the charge on the metals that I'm not required to know the charge on. So anything that is not in group 1, 2, zinc, cadmium, or silver. Okay. Lead is not one of those, so I have to specify the charge in the name. Because then I can put it here. The next part is you saw me try and skip away and not come back to this one. Because I knew I needed to do math. I know I'm weak at math, so I skipped it. Or tried to, unsuccessfully. Because I answered everything else. Okay. So I now had to go through and do with, deal with the math. I, very oddly, I put in an X on the acetate as opposed to on the lead. It doesn't matter. All those are our variables. I remember I said when I add those two up, I need to neutralize the charge. So the charge on those two must equal zero. But I don't know how much acetate or how much lead. So they're variables. They're an unknown amount. Okay. With one equation and two unknowns, it is impossible to solve. Right? Or technically, there's an infinite number of possibilities. Okay? So there's a couple things that come into this. Number one, when we build our formula, we use the smallest whole number possible, whole numbers that are possible. Okay? So I'm going to say y equals 1. It doesn't really matter. I'm guessing. And I'm picking a small whole number, y equals 1. If I do that, I can now substitute that information in. 1 times plus 4 is 4. I don't know what x is yet. I just made a guess that y was 1. What I'm now doing is testing the validity of that. So x times minus 1 is minus x. 4 minus x must equal 0. I can now solve for x. x equals 4. Is 4 a whole number? Yes. Because it is a whole number, my guess was valid. And I can now substitute where those things showed up. Those were the number of each of those pieces. Remember where we specify the number of each piece? As a subscript immediately after it. So there's a 1 immediately after this lead. Why did I not write it? Why do I not need to write it? By me writing the symbol PB, what am I implying? that there is at least one there. Okay? If I needed to write it, guess what else I would need to write? Every other element on the periodic table followed by a zero because they weren't there. Okay? That's why the one can be implied. Okay? The acetate, I put a four. Notice I also put parentheses. Why did I put the parentheses? Okay, we could go with the argument that it's a compound. Get rid of the parentheses. Now what's my formula? PBC2H3O24. No, it's not O24. There were four acetates. That four needs to apply to this, to this, and to this. The only way it can apply back to those individual things is if I make sure I put a parenthesis around it, because now what is the 4 applying to? It applies to the parentheses. Whatever is in the parentheses now multiplies out by 4. <clears throat> Make sense? Right. And it doesn't have to right now. Right. That's okay. It's going to require practice. <clears throat> Any of the other ones you want me to look at? The second one? Second to last. So the tricarbon dioxide. So where did I start? Carbon has a symbol C. Oxide. What element is oxide? Oxygen. Why did you say oxygen? Because that says oxide. They're the same element, but different 
charges. So when we go through to build our names, we'll leave the first element alone. The last element will change the ending <coughs> on it. Because if I just said tricarbon dioxygen, well, now it sounds like I'm looking at two different things. Right? So I want to make sure that those things are tied to each other. The way I tie them is I leave the first one alone. The second one I change the suffix on. I change its ending to the IDE. Right? So that would give me carbon and then the oxygen, so C and O. But then I also have tri and di. Tri means three. What was that tri in front of? Carbon, which means in my formula, I need a 3 applying only to the carbon. <coughs> the dioxide says that there are now two oxygens. I need the 2 immediately next to the oxygen. How do I know di and tri are 2 and 3? You memorized it. Okay? You're required to know what the Greek prefixes mean. Di, tri, tetra. <coughs> Penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. I knew we were going to hit a button somewhere. Undeca, dodeca. I actually don't know after that. So let's process it. Undeca. What is deck? Deck is 10. What is un? One. one. So I have 1 and 10. That gets me 11. Do deca? 12. 12. So how is number 1 different from number 3? Carbon is a non-metal, oxygen is a non-metal, okay? which makes that bond a covalent bond. That gets a different name than what's happening in one. What is happening in one? Chromium is a metal, which means an ionic compound, different rule set. Notice the work for number one is fairly similar to the work for number four. Why? They're both ionic. Yeah. Why is it ionic? Why do I specify the oxygen is a negative 2 on the very first one? Because it is an ionic compound, I'm required to know the charge on certain elements. Is oxygen one of those elements that I told you you needed to know the charge on? Yes. Yep. Why? Nomenclature. <laughs> right? What is the charge on oxygen and tricarbon dioxide? There isn't one. Don't specify it. Okay. Why is there not a charge in tricarbon dioxide, but there is in chromium oxide? Because they have the same charge. Chromium oxide is an ionic compound, which means I would need to look at the charges. ionic charges. Oxygen in tricarbon dioxide is a covalent compound, which means... Don't look at the ionic charges. That's why we say ionic charges. Okay. Yes, that is confusing. And it will be made more confusing later in this very same unit. Okay. But you need to at least get the basics of this down first before we start messing with what things are actually called. Because okay. these are at least consistently used across the spectrum. Kind of make sense? Okay. Everybody needs to practice nomenclature. Okay, everybody. Okay. It is such a big concept as far as chemistry goes in the understanding of how to name. The actual name isn't all that important, but the process on how you name is super, super incredibly important. Okay. So how would you be able to get practice with the process? We could go to the tutoring center. You sit down in the tutoring center and say, I need practice with the nomenclature. What are they going to do? Okay, that's nice. We could Google chemistry nomenclature practice. 
right? Get questions. There's tons of compounds out there. What you need to do is start naming compounds, right? So you could Google it. There are online quiz systems that will actually test you on nomenclature. Go ahead and take advantage of those. Right? It is such an important topic as far as, again, that process and the practice behind nomenclature that when we put together the course, we decided that you needed lots and lots of practice and so much practice on nomenclature that we couldn't spend it all on the lecture. So we've also done it in the lab. Take a look at the lab that's supposed to happen right before spring break. It is all nomenclature. So if you pull out your lab packet, lab, I believe it's six, okay, is six pages of nomenclature. Okay? So use that to practice. Okay? For those of you that are like, wow, that's a lot of practice. I don't want to do that. You're in the lab. You're going to. <laughs> it's a lab. You have to finish that. So that means do it now so that the week before spring break, when you've done the exam and you're now ready for the exam because of the nomenclature, you can come into lab and I'll be like, it's nomenclature day. We're just going to do nomenclature. And you can be like, here's my nomenclature packet. It's completed. Okay. I got nothing else for you. Do you have any questions? You probably won't if you're in the Thursday lab class because you'll be brain dead from the exam and you're done. Okay. If you're in the Tuesday lab, what do you do? You're still busy preparing for studying for the exam. Maybe what you do is actually stay in lab and ask questions to get you prepared for the exam. Is that a question, Felicia? No. Questions? So for the second one, would you have saved, taken off the A? So I'm surprised no one mentioned this yet. Okay. I mumbled, this was one of the things I mumbled under my breath. Okay. Five is penta, and then O was oxide. I don't know if it's penta oxide or penta oxide. I'm, I, I would say no because there's two vowels, but I'm pretty sure I've been proven wrong on it a couple times. So I literally don't know. Okay. That's looking at a nuance of a rule that just I don't care to deal with. Okay. Should you care to deal with it if I don't care? No. Yeah, no. Remember, multiple choice. If I gave you dinitrogen pentaoxide and dinitrogen pentoxide on the exam, I would say I'd give you free permission to come up and punch me. Um, but then I might do it anyway just to be a jerk. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't, that, that doesn't make sense. That's a rude thing to do. Okay? I'm not entirely rude. Okay? So, more practice. Okay. The tutoring center has a lot of useful things when it comes to nomenclature. We've got the workshops, okay, but then extra than that, remember I said they have varying handouts for different pieces of information. Nomenclature troubles so many people that the tutoring center built, I believe, three different worksheets all about nomenclature rules. So go to the tutoring center and get those rules because they organized it really, 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 really well. I will also say that they put in all the nomenclature for like 151, which you are not responsible for. So do not memorize everything on those sheets. Use them as an aid. Lab manual, you've got practice. Lab 6 is your nomenclature. Do it sooner than the lab. Okay. Lab 7 was Lewis structure. Don't worry about that one. Okay. So in our remaining time, we're going to shift away from nomenclature, and we're going to look at some mathematics stuff, okay, some other things in PSS. So if we had this 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, and I asked you to actually write that in the notes, okay, would you get kind of irritated with having to write that out? Why? It's long. It's very repetitive. Okay? If we had to do that in the calculator, it would also be very repetitive. What is a shortcut? Okay. Four to the power of six. Okay, so we can take advantage of exponents to shorten our calculations. 
right? Make sure you understand how to take advantage of exponents when you enter them into the calculator. You will have to do it, right? So make sure you know how to do that before the exam, right? There are some common exponents systems that get used. That's why we encounter terms like squared and cubed, because we're looking at measuring the volume of a two-dimensional square or the volume of a cube. How would we measure the volume of a square? Length times width, meaning 1 times 1. There's a squaring. What's cubed? 1 times 1 times 1. We did three calculations. That's where the cubed is coming from. Right. The next big part where exponents come in is your powers of 10. Okay. We've got lots of powers of 10. We will add to this chart a little bit later. Okay, but the primary reason behind our powers of 10 is to look at scientific notation. If I take a really big number and I don't want to write out all of the zeros that are placeholders, I can use scientific notation to shorten that number down and then just provide a scaling factor, our multiple of 10 to just scale it upwards. Okay, so that's kind of a neat system. So let's take a look at some scientific notation. By definition, it must fit the pattern shown down here. Okay, so we'll take whatever our number is, take our first significant digit, place it in the ones place, followed by the decimal point, followed by the rest of our significant digits. We'll then multiply by 10 to whatever power we shifted the decimal point. Okay? So let's take a look at the number up top. If I want to turn that into scientific notation, how could I go through and do that? 4.063 times 10. times 10. Why did I not include all those other zeros? You're gonna include those were not significant digits. Those are placeholder zeros. I want my power of 10 to take care of those. Make sense? Okay, so how far did I shift the decimal? Well, there's the phantom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight places. So 10 to that eight. Is my number really big or really small? Big, so that's going to be a positive eight. Don't want to write positive, that's fine. The positive can be implied. How about the next number? One, one, six. one decimal point, one, six times 10. ten. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. To the 7, is my number really small or really big? Small, put the negative in. You will hear people talk about, well, you shifted the decimal to the left or to the right. I would ignore that and just say, is the number big or small? Because right? the left and right, guess what? If I now go from scientific notation to non-scientific, where do I have to move the decimal? opposite direction that I started, which means depending on which way you count, left or right, you can easily get them confused. Just decide, is the number supposed to be big or small? That solves it. Okay. So there are rules on it. I want to do one thing real quickly here. So here's our cliffhanger to end on. What I want you to do is to report the number shown up here. <clears throat> with six sig figs. Right. How would you rewrite that number to get six sig figs? Right. So what are we saying? These zeros are significant digits. These ones are not. And with that, we'll